Hey Flock, Mike here with Epic Duck Studios and welcome to the Epic Hobby. Today I'm going to be painting Red Skull from the Marvel Crisis Protocol starter set in comic style. Now, Red Skull's costume is dominated by this black trench coat. And painting black in comic style is always a unique challenge because we use black to do a lot of line work and we lose that ability when the whole surface is black. Now I'm going to compare this to Black Widow who I've also painted predominantly black. They have kind of different approaches we're going to take with them, though. So referencing Red Skull's card art, we basically just have three different color groupings here. We have red, we have blue in the Tesseract, and then just all sorts of black and gray. And there's just a little hint of white at the sharpest creases. You can really notice it on the boots and a few little details on the jacket, such as the buckles and so on. The white is really minimal but it is present and that's important. Now the Tesseract also poses a unique challenge on this piece because we want it to feel as if it's emitting light. And in comic style, the way we do that is by not having any black lines present. We make sure the line work is all brighter or absent. And that gives you the illusion of something just being brighter than its surroundings. So to begin, I'm gonna start base coating pretty much the whole model here with P3 Thamar Black. If you're using Citadel Paint, Abaddon Black would work just fine. Now the black base coat goes on just about everything here. The boots, the trench coat, the arms, the sleeves, the gloves, basically everything but his head and the Tesseract. There's also a Hydra emblem on his shoulders that you'll want to paint, probably in red to match his face. That's the way the card art deals with it. You honestly could save a lot of time by priming this model black instead of starting with it white like I have here. Now I'm going to go ahead and apply a second coat of Thamar Black because I really want to make sure that black base coat is nice and solid, doesn't really have any splotchiness or weak points to it. Now it's time to give that black a minute to dry and then come back and do something a lot more interesting. For Red Skull's face and the Hydra logos on his shoulders, I'm going to begin with a base coat of Amethyst Rose and then highlight that with Kador Red Base. This is a really straightforward base coat, and it's a very small detail. It's literally just his head and the two emblems on his shoulders. It takes a minute. It's really quick. With his face, I'm trying to be as careful that I don't blot out the details with thick paint as possible, so I'm really pushing the paint around, making sure it goes on smoothly. But Amethyst Rose is such a nicely, deeply pigmented color. It pretty much gives you perfect one coat coverage, even when applied you know, in just a single thin coat. It's honestly become one of my favorite base coats for red. Now I decided to start the Tesseract with Bad Bruise, which is kind of a dark bluish purple. Ultimately this ended up being too dark and I go over it with some lighter colors as I progress. So if you're kind of looking at this going, wow, that is just gonna be way too dark. I absolutely agree and I probably could have started with something much lighter. Now with all the base coats done on Red Skull himself, I'm going to throw some Mechanica Standard Grey down on the base. This is just the same color I'm using to tie all of my Crisis Protocol bases together. I'm also going to use a tiny bit of the Mechanica Standard Grey on Red Skull's belt buckle and buttons because obviously I want them to stand out apart from the leather jacket he's wearing. All right, now it's time to get into our highlighting, and I'm going to be using P3 Coal Black as the first highlight on the leather jacket. Originally, I had wanted to go with a very flat gray for the highlights, and the reason for that is I wanted to represent Red Skull's card art, which if you look at his card art versus Black Widow's, his card art is very much, you know, black, then gray, then white as the highlight sequence, whereas Black Widow has a little hint of blue in hers, and I wanted to distinguish them. But what I really decided when I got to this point was I wanted to pull in some of the blue tones going to be using on the Tesseract into the rest of his costume to help tie them together. It makes it feel like they kind of belong together. And it just keeps the palette shorter, which is kind of an homage to the older, what do you call the four color heroes, the characters where everything was printed in sort of big flat colors. It just ties back to comic history and it's just a fun little homage for me to include. 
So to add the highlights here, I'm employing a little rule of thumb I call the 60-30-10 rule, and I'm not the originator of that. It's a very common thing that painters use when they're painting black, and the idea is that 60% or more than half of your area should just be straight black. Another 30% should be your basic highlight, and that's where you get to include a little bit of color if you want to. And the final 5-10%, to 10%, just that very sharpest edge, that last little hit, should be bright white. So what I'm doing here, this is the 30. This is adding large areas of color that don't dominate, but really help define the different shapes that are happening here. Because we have some different layered textures happening, or not really textures, but different layered areas. There's some creases in the jacket, there's some belts and some straps and some wrinkles. And we can use the blue here, the coal black rather, to just really make them much more visible. And what I'm doing is I'm also focusing that up towards the shoulders, the top of the model is brightest and there's two reasons for that the first is, of course we've got the test rack there we want it to kind of feel like it's a light source so nearest the test rack near the top of the model should be brighter but it also helps draw the eye up to the test rack in the face you know the bottom of the model isn't something that's terribly interesting or important it's just a trench coat and some shoes and so by focusing the majority of the color to the top of the model we get kind of just a natural attention grabbing area now, Red Skull benefits from the fact that just the Tesseract and his face are so distinct from the rest of his clothing that you don't really need help drawing attention to them. They're, they naturally do that. And so if you end up accidentally sort of flattening out your highlights on his clothing, it's going to be less impactful, but it's not going to matter as much as it would on, say, a character where they don't have these really punchy bits of color to kind of draw you in. So with all the coal black work done, I'm coming with a little bit of a lighter color. I'm going to be using Troll Blood Base from P3. And this would be considered the 10 in the 60-30-10 model of painting black. Now I am going to add a further highlight after this just to a few very specific points. But this is really sort of my brightest point for the majority of the model. And I'm using it to really make the sharp edges distinct. You know, I'm being much more... Much more reserved with it than I was with the coal black, for example. You know, it's much more tightly focused, and it's really being used to draw your attention to shapes. And the reason we really need to do that is because with the cloak primarily being black, there's not a lot of room for black lining, which is what we typically use in comic style to create the impression of shape. You know, we outline things with big black lines, but you can't outline a black thing with black lines. It just is just more black. Now, that said, I am going to do some black lining, but it's going to be very minimal. And it's also just going to follow the major folds of the trench coat here. And because it's black on black, you know, it's black ink against Thamar Black, it doesn't show up a lot. It really just creates a tiny bit more depth to the shadow. But the way we really, really create that depth is by having these bright spots that sit adjacent to where we want to put those black lines. Because we get that contrast between a tiny bright little edge highlight and a deep dark black area. Now here I can use these bright highlights to make his hand more evident. Because we've got you know a black gloved hand in a black sleeve against a black jacket, it kind of can all feel really flat. And so we can use highlights to just make one detail feel more dominant than the one behind it. And we do this a lot in comic style painting anyway by adding deep dark shadows to the, you know, the rearmost object. So we're basically doing the same thing here by leaving, you know, the trench coat darker than the hand by adding more highlights to the hand and to the sleeve. Now, to top off my highlighting sequence here, I'm going to be using some P3 Frostbite. And this is a lightly blue-tinted white. And you can see I'm being very, very controlled with it. It's just a couple little sharp points to really draw out sort of the broadness of his shoulders and the shape of the collar. And it's really not much more than that. So now I'm going to take some Kador Red Base, my red highlight, and I'm going to begin by highlighting the Hydra emblems on his shoulder. So that's going to start with just sort of like a half moon shape across the top of each logo. 
and then picking out a few of the little hydro tentacles and being very careful when I do that because the logo is very, very small and really easy to mess up. Before I highlight Red Skull's face, I want to get some color in for his eye. I'm not going to bother with pupils, I just want a solid white, creepy eye. I'm using P3 Moro White here, I just forgot to introduce the color. So what I'm doing here is I'm painting a little bit more than the eye, and then I'll come in with either red paint or black ink later to tightly focus it back down. Using a little bit of P3 Underbelly Blue, I'm going to quickly add a highlight to his belt buckle and his buttons. So now I'm going to begin detailing the Tesseract. I'm going to begin by mixing some Troll Blood base into the Bad Bruise. If you remember, Bad Bruise is the purple color I base coat the Tesseract with. And I'm going to leave as little of that left as possible. So the way I'm painting the Tesseract is I basically have two opposing glow corners. You'll see I start to focus all of the bright colors into a single point, And then the complete opposite corner of the Tesseract gets the same kind of focus. And it creates a sort of feel of it being sort of translucent. It's not perfect, but of course you can't produce perfect translucency on a non-translucent object. So it's just enough to hint at it. And because we're not going to include any kind of black lining, this does feel as if it's either translucent or glowing or a little bit of both because it just doesn't feel the same weight as the rest of the model. It's got a sort of just a different presence. So here you can see me focusing that brighter color now down towards the opposite corner, down towards his palm. So we basically got the one furthest away from him and the one closest to him as our two bright points. And now I've taken a little bit of that P3 Frostbite and mixed it in with just a little touch of the Troll Blood base. And I'm really creating that bright point on those two opposing corners. By having our two bright points completely opposite each other, it gives the idea that light is refracting. You know, it's kind of passing directly through and kind of just bouncing and focusing on those two corners. Now that said, that left a lot of sides that were really just kind of blending together where the purple corners all sort of met. And so I decided to add a little bit of an edge highlight just along the top here to just make those edges a little more visible. And because the whole Tesseract just felt too purple, I'm coming in now with a little bit more of the Troll Blood base and just brightening up that blue kind of casting off of the white, the brighter area I've already created. And I've actually thinned this down to not quite a glazed consistency, but close. And I'm using it to actually blot out a lot of the bad brews, start to really just get rid of that purple, except in a few of the deepest shadow points. So I think the takeaway here is that the process I'm using for the Tesseract is kind of organic. I'm just sort of making it up as I go. And I'm just building up the highlights and the lighting until it gets to a point where I start to like what I'm looking at. And then just keep kind of filling with the brightness and the color. So now I'm going to bring out a little bit of pure moral white, which is a nice bright white. I'm going to use this to just really pop up those brighter spots on the Tesseract because I just felt like the Troll Blood base and the underbelly blue I already had on my palette just weren't quite bright enough. And now using the Moro White, just thin down a little bit. I'm basically expanding that white area so it's a little bit bigger. Going to make the whole cube just significantly brighter. So I'm starting with the white and then I'm going to bloom the blue out of it. Now I forgot to show the pot of paint I'm using here, but this is Arcane Blue from P3. It's a nice bright blue with just a little hint of green in it. It's kind of comparable to Teclis Blue, only Teclis doesn't have that green flavor. And now I've gone ahead and just thinned down the Arcane Blue, just add a little bit of water into it, made it into a bit of a glaze, and I'm using that to just tint and sort of brighten up 
the little bit of bad brews is still showing really start to push it more into the blues and away from the purples. Now the test rack isn't quite done here, but you can see as I rotate it around that the bits of purple that are still showing, the bits of bad brews, kind of create the idea of depth or some internal dimension to the cube. And I'm still going to leave a little bit of that in place, just in its deepest corners. I want that little hint of something deeper inside of it, and that's what kind of gives it the feeling of being translucent. And now just to make sure the whole thing is really glowy and vibrant, I've gone back to white and I'm just using it to really pick up the edges of the cube. Alright, so that wasn't the most direct route, but I'm pretty happy with the Tesseract at this point. It's got a good feel of some sort of internal refraction happening and the edges stand out a lot better than what I had originally started with. So now I'm coming back in with Amethyst Rose, that's the red base coat color, and I'm using this to just add some shape back to the eyes because I did paint them a little bit oversized. I want to make sure the whole eye was covered. This is where I come back in now with the red paint and just really try to kind of refine that sort of almond shape the eye has. With the eye shape fixed, I'm now going to come in with some Kato Red Base and begin highlighting the face. And I'm really focusing on just bringing out sort of the geometry of the face. So there's like the really pronounced brow ridge, the nose, the cheekbones, and the ears. And of course the top of the head because it's just a big light catching surface. But those are really my focus points, that and the chin and bottom lip as well. Now often with comic style painting I don't do a lot of blending because the details are usually typically small enough and the highlights are kind of really concentrated and it doesn't really become necessary. But with a really big kind of rounded surface like the skull here, what I'm going to do is just kind of feather the edge of that by either thinning down the Kato Red base a little bit or by making a 50-50 mix of it and the underlying amethyst rose, and then just sort of outlining that big, bright spot I put on top of the head. Now I want to add one more series of highlights, just really bringing out some of those really prominent details in the face. What I've done is just mix a little bit of white into the Kato Red base, just to get a bit of a pinkish tone. And I'm really using this just for those, really, the sharp points on the face, so the eyebrow ridge, the nose, the cheekbones. Red Skull also has a little bit of a scowl going on, so I'm going to add a tiny little, basically a little V on his forehead between the two eyebrows. Now at this point, Red Skull is basically done unless I want to go back in and do some comic style lining, which I am obviously going to do, but you're not required to by any means. What I'm doing here is just adding a quick coat of red to the edge of the base. And this is just something I've been doing with all of my villain characters in Marvel Crisis Protocol. Basically, anyone who is identifiably a bad guy is getting a red base. Anyone who is identifiably a good guy was getting a blue base. And then there's some people in, like, Venom who are kind of ambiguous. And now we're at my favorite part of comic style painting. And that is, of course, black lining or black inking to really bring the detail out in the model. Now this is a little bit more challenging on Red Skull because his whole outfit is basically black already and we're not going to do a whole lot of lining or a lot of shading like I normally would. It's going to be very very quick as far as Red Skull is concerned. It's going to be a little bit of detail on his face and the lining on the base just to bring it in line with my other Crisis Protocol bases. So the first line I'm adding is just a quick black line separating the you know detail elements of the base from that colored rim. It just is really quick and straightforward. From there, I'm following all the different grooves and cracks in the base and just drawing in them with black as well so that they're a little more evident, they're not just flat. Now, it's worth noting these grooves are actually fairly deep, and if you completely fill them with black, it can actually be a little bit overpowering. It is worth just paying attention to that. You can see the one kind of running front to back across the base. I haven't come all the way up onto the side of it, just so that visually it didn't become quite so dark. Now there's some blemishes on the base as well, these are just little dents and dings, and I'm outlining those with black, and then either filling them in with just some little scratch marks, or just kind of leaving them as just an empty circle. After that I add some freehanded details as well, these tend to be more, in my thinking, are, you know, oil spills or other kind of stains that appear on sidewalks. So you can see I give them kind of, you know, fluid, coffee stain-ish shapes, and fill them in with just a little series of diagonal lines, just to make them look darker than the surrounding base. With the black lining done on the base, it's time to start adding some to Red Skull's jacket. Now his jacket is 
again, fairly black already. There's not a lot of room for adding black lining, but what I'm doing is just picking out the major details, so the collar, the belt, the big folds in his trench coat, and just drawing a quick line around those. And it's just because the Daler Rowney black ink is just a little bit darker than the Thammer black we've already used, and is certainly darker than the coal black. And so there's still a little bit of room for a darker black on this model. You know, it's... We're not already all the way as dark as we can get, and so these black lines do actually add a little bit more depth, a little bit more shadow than was already present on the model. So now I'm working on adding some black lining to Red Skull's head, and this is where they're going to be most evident on the character itself, because there's really nothing else left to line. We don't want any on the Tesseract, and his coat is just done. So at this point, what I'm doing is I'm outlining between his neck and the coat, and also adding just a little bit of a line underneath the jaw, just to help accent that jawline. You know, coming in from under the chin, and just up around, you know, the left-hand side of the jaw there, and then here, the right-hand side of the jaw. Also putting a tiny little line just in behind his ear, just so it's more evident, because it's actually a pretty flat detail. There's not a lot of dimension to it, and so the line actually helps make it just be a little more prominent, a little more visible. Two very thin lines help define the mouth by going underneath the top lip and then underneath the bottom lip. The shape of Red Skull's eyes is fully defined by black ink here, and we carry the black ink almost all the way out to the edge of the brow. And what that does is it gives you a really sinister sense of the eye because it's kind of encased in, you know, this deep dark black. And the eye really stands out because of it. Here, a really small line underneath the cheekbone helps make that detail more obvious. One of the last details on his face, I'm adding a little black line just to really make that scowl on his forehead much more obvious. It, you know, you can see the deep wrinkle that's forming there, which isn't really sculpted that deeply. So this really helps bring that detail forward. Now what I'm doing here is I've come back in with a little bit of red paint and I'm just using it to touch up some of the line work because a couple of the lines end up a little bit heavy handed and that's almost unavoidable when you've got a really small face you're trying to outline things on. Some of the black lines just by necessity are going to be a little bit bigger than you want and the fix for that is just to kind of come in with whatever your skin tone is or in this case, I mean I guess it's skin anyway with the red and by overlaying just a little bit of the black line you can make the lines appear smaller and a little more crisp. And that wraps up Red Skull. Honestly, for what I thought was going to be a very boring, flat model, there's a lot of detail you can pull out of this with highlighting and just a really good use of black. I hope you guys follow along, enjoy this tutorial, and try this yourself. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, do something epic. Hey, thanks for watching my video. If you enjoyed that one, please hit like and subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell so you get notifications when I post new videos in the future. If you want to take your support even further, you can do that at patreon.com slash epicduck. Every little bit helps keep the lights on and the paint flowing, puts new models on the table so I can make interesting videos, and most importantly, puts a roof over my family's head and food on the table. You can also join me for live painting shows several times a week at twitch.tv slash epicduckstudios. I'd love if you came by and watched the show sometime and followed the channel. I want to give a big thank you to everyone who's supported my content over the years, both past and present. It's been an absolutely wild ride, and I couldn't do this without all the wonderful fans and flockers out there. The hobby community is just an amazing group of people and you really make this worth doing. So let's just keep on doing this together and making more content and just being fantastic together for years to come. Thanks again for watching and until next time, do something epic.